in your life, you deserve to be more, be more, do more, have more, and give more. And now the Becoming More podcast with Diana Kokoska. Welcome to the Becoming More podcast, where we learn to become more through other people's stories. Keith Brown is our guest today, and Keith is a husband, father of four, and deeply committed to his faith. He is a rain or shine Michigan State fan and has 20 plus years of experience in the nonprofit sector and extensive business and management experience in organizations of various kinds. Now, Keith has a master's and doctorate degree in leadership. Keith is an executive director with the John Maxwell team and currently serves as senior pastor of Multi-Site Church in Southwest Michigan. Now, I've got to tell you, I'm so excited. I met Keith in Orlando, Florida. Yes, at a John Maxwell event, and we just hit it off. I like his energy. I like his passion. I like his let's go achieve type of attitude, as well as this down to earth, Let's get into people's heart and help them show the passion that they have for life. He's there to help. He's very caring, and he has definitely become more. So let's welcome Keith Brown. So Keith, I'm so excited for you to be with us because I know you've got a great story. So let's just dive right in right then and tell us, what is your story? Who is Keith Brown? Yeah, well, I'm still trying to figure that out. I'm trying to figure out who who am I going to be when I grow up. Um, but I would say I grew up in Southeast Louisiana. Go Cajuns, um, or <laughs> or go uh, Tigers, actually, probably. Um, grew up eating crawfish, crawfish etouffee. If you ever want some great crawfish etouffee, my mom makes the best crawfish etouffee. I- I love that. So where do I have to go to get this? You got to go to you got to go to to Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and she will hook you up with some great uh, crawfish A2A fay. But yeah, so grow up, grew up uh, down south. Then um, right after Bible college, I began to uh, think about what was next for me. And um, I was just praying, trying to figure out what's next. And a mentor of mine um, was running a youth ministry, part of a church plant in Dallas, Fort Worth and said, Hey, Keith, would you want to be my assistant? So I was so excited about that Moved to Dallas, Texas. And I was so excited about like, Hey, Dallas, we're going to go take the world. And then I didn't realize that Dallas was a lot different from Baton Rouge, Louisiana. So I had to do a lot of growing, a lot of changing there. Um, then I moved from Dallas, Texas to Michigan, Three Rivers, Michigan. And that was an interesting thing. So Baton Rouge was 500,000. Dallas was 7 million. And then I moved from there to 7,000 in Three Rivers, Michigan. So talk about, wow, that, yeah. that is like a big change in environment. What, what happened yeah, when super you did that? Change. But it was cool though because um I was just learning what it what it was like to be in the south to be in, in the north. Uh, I met my wife. We had our first two kids here in Michigan. Uh, then moved back to Dallas Fort Worth, did some church planting. That's where I started working on my master's. Um, and then from there, um, basically moved to California back here to Michigan. And, um, and the rest has been kind of fun. It's been history, just doing a lot of cool stuff. Um, mostly my work has been in the church nonprofit world. So, yeah. So Keith, you've had so many achievements in your life and I know you're very fast paced. You're always challenging yourself. Talk to us about some of those achievements, put your humility in your pocket. Uh, all right. Well, where do you want me to start? Um, high school, college. Um, Let's start in high school and really bring us up. You said high school? Yeah. Yeah. Well, so in high school, um, it was a neat thing. I was part of a pretty large church. And going in from my junior year into my senior year in high school, my youth pastor said, Keith, what would it be like if you lived with no regrets? 
this, this last year of high school, what would it be like if you really made the biggest possible difference you could with your life? I'll give you whatever you need. So I said, all right, let's give this a try. So I started this Bible study in my high school with five kids and it grew to about 250 kids. And that was really um, just a moment for me. And I think the moment was twofold. One is um, at that moment, I was trying to figure out, do I go uh, to be a doctor, a uh, medical doctor and make a lot of money, which was really my dream. But I was feeling this tug towards ministry to, to really help people in, in professional full-time ministry. Well, after doing that, it was pretty clear that my direction was set, that it was, uh, God was calling me to go into full-time ministry. So I did, um, graduated from high school, got hired on at that church, um, in their student department, got a scholarship to go to Bible college and, and did that and was able to really, um, make a huge impact at that church. Um, and then from there, I moved to Dallas Fort Worth to then work with another youth department, um, and really just did a lot in the schools. So somewhere between a thousand to 2000 students on a regular basis, I was able to touch, um, during that season of my life. So yeah, that, that was kind of, that was high school, early days of college. I just had an opportunity to speak with someone that works with you. And they said they have never worked with somebody that moves so fast. <laughs> yeah, so, I get that a lot. so tell us, cause you've got a great team and you are known for building a great team. Some of the things that it takes to have a team that it's willing to do whatever it takes to make goal. Yeah, so I think when it comes to team, there's a few things. Number one is I think you as a leader have to have a clear vision. If you don't know where you're going, then people don't know what they're signing up to be a part of. So one of the things I try to spend a lot of time doing is really figuring out what is that, that huge mark that I'm shooting for, and then people can decide. The second thing is I think to have a great team, you got to ask the best of people. Um, I think that uh, we live in somewhat of a culture where some people are like, hey, you know, just make it easy for people. And and maybe some people are interested in that. But I think a lot of people want to be stretched and challenged and want to be a part of something bigger than themselves. So I think a big vision, um, I think something that, that calls the best out of people. And then I think um, everybody wants to be on a team where somebody believes the best in them. And, and it's going to cheer them on. And so I think that, that those are some of the things that I've tried to do, cast a huge vision, try to not ask something insulting of people, but ask the best of them, and then try to cheer people on. And then also, I think, give people feedback and growth opportunities. Mm -hmm. I think if people aren't growing and being challenged and they're not getting feedback, you're not really helping them. So those are some of the things I would say. Keith, sometimes feedback is difficult to handle. Mm -hmm. You have to give them negative or corrective feedback and you do it out of love. Explain to us, how do you give that feedback? Yeah, so I think that's one of the hardest part about leading for me is when you love people, you don't wanna hurt people, but you know that if yeah. somebody has a blind spot that it's gonna hurt um, to give them good feedback. So a few things that I do is at first I try to prepare myself and I try to put myself in their shoes. And I remember what it oh, was like good. at times to receive hard feedback, things that were challenging. So I try to put myself in that mindset. Hey, what would I want to hear? How would I want to hear that? But then number two is I try to be really clear and I think that when you're delivering hard news to people, uh, if it's a blind spot, people are going to take it emotionally first. And so if you're not clear, that's where you can live at. But if you are clear about what you're trying to help a person grow in, then it's easier once you can move past the emotion. Okay, here's what I'm saying. I'm not saying you're a terrible person, but I'm saying you could do better 
in this specifically. And then one of the things I've uh, really tried to work at um, and be good at is then following up with people as far as uh, doing that, um, summarizing what we communicated. And then I like to also do that in written form too, especially if it's a hard conversation. Hey, dear Jim, hey, I really appreciate the fact that we had to talk about blah, 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 whatever this issue was. And um, here's some of the things that I see you doing well at. Here's some of the things that I'd like to see you grow in. And then here's some of the things that we agreed that we would work towards. And what I've found in a leadership role, especially in a supervisory role, that really covers my basis because when we come back later, the emotions don't change what I said. No, we talked about this. And remember, we got the email where we actually talked about these are or the specific things we're working on. And um, and that's what I found. And if you can do that in the safety of a relationship, I found that um, hard conversations are always hard, but they're less hard if there's clarity and good follow-up. Those, those are what I've seen. I love what you're saying. I think it's really important. And you have a great relationship with these people. Do you establish that during the interview process? And if so, what are some of the ways that you establish a great relationship starting out? Yeah, um, and this is something John's been teaching me, John Maxwell, is the idea about setting good expectations um, with people. And I think that, so like you talked about me being fast paced and that type of thing, everybody who meets me um, kind of picks that up pretty well on. So I try not to deny that and just be kind of clear with, hey, here's what it's going to be like to be on my team. And I just want to make sure you can you can understand that. And, and here's where I think I'm going to really win with you. Here's some places where I'm not going to win with you in the sense of, you know, there's some people, um, some pastors who are very relational and they'll hug you every time they see you. I would love to be one of those guys. That's just not me. So I don't set that expectation, but will I be loyal to you? Will I make sure you get good feedback? You know where you stand. Will we have a open door policy that with respect that you can communicate with me what you're concerned about? Those are the things that I found. feel like if I set those expectations pretty well, and then I, if I keep my commitment, then people then can understand what kind of relationship we're in. And so that's sort of how I've really tried to work at uh, having good relationships is being clear up front. And then at the same time, um, being consistent with what I said I was going to do. You know, I think the consistency and actually doing what you say you're going to do, because the example speaks so loud. Now, your people, when I was speaking with them, said, you are a great leader. What are some characteristics that you believe great leaders have? Well, number one, um, I'm glad that they said that. Um, I, uh, I've i been paying them <laughs> to say stuff like that. <laughs> um, no, no, no. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I here's what I would say. So I come from obviously a faith background. So for me, um, I think, um, and I would imagine that some of your listeners are business leaders, and and I have my my hand in that world as well. But I would say for me as a faith person of faith, what a great leader to me has is that sense of calling. Like I do what I do out of passion and calling. And I think if you don't have passion and calling, people can tell that because whatever you're doing, whether you're leading a business, you're leading a school, it gets hard. And when it gets hard, people need to see your why it needs to come out. So, so a sense of passion is important. Uh, we talked about it before, integrity, doing what you said you were going to do. If you said you're going to give people a raise, if you said you're going to give them good feedback, I, I think people expect you to do both the things that you said that you're going to do that they like 
and the things that you said that you were going to do that maybe they were uncomfortable with it, it they can build trust in that way and then i would also say um and, and I'm a kind of a goal-driven person, but I think somebody who accomplishes what they set out to accomplish, that also builds um, a sense of trust and, and dependability we're going somewhere. Um, and then I guess the last thing would be, um, I know we talked about integrity and character a lot, but I think, yeah, if if you are not, if people can't trust your ability to make a sound moral decision, then they have a really hard time with you, especially when they disagree. If I can think, hey, Diana's a good person, even though I don't maybe think all of our decisions are good, I can be at peace with, with you. But if I question your character, I think that's really hard to look at you as a great leader. And that's what I, that's what I would say. Those are my thoughts. I, I like that because see what I'm hearing here is you're a very loyal person, not, mm. not just to, to your football and all of your sports teams yet. You're very loyal to the people that you work with loyal to the point that you'll do whatever it takes to help them become the very best that they can be. How important is loyalty in the people that work with you? Yeah, I think loyalty is the whole game because I think that in the economy that we live in, um, I can never pay somebody enough to stay. I mean, I think, you know, I can be competitive if I can be, but but if somebody can understand that I'm here and you can really grow with me and there's a purpose, I think that that's the greatest paycheck we can give people. So loyalty is huge. And, and that's a big thing for me, even as I'm screening people, is I want to sort of know what am I getting out of person? Are they coming on my staff because they have some alternate agenda or do they really want to be a part of the family and obviously people will grow and change and get new opportunities but i think it's very loyal i think loyalty is very important it's something i give and it's also something i look for in people because if we are loyal to each other we can grow together if we're not loyal to each other then we're just using each other and i just think that you can't build a great organization with people who are not loyal and if you're not a loyal person as well so that's kind of my thoughts on that yeah it, well it goes both ways absolutely and with you majoring in leadership and having a degree in leadership a lot of people are thrust into a leadership position they some of them don't even know how to write a mission or a vision statement mm -hmm. yet what advice do you have for them if they're just starting out in this leadership journey? Yeah, I would say one of the great things is finding mentors. I think that that's one of the things I'm excited about our friendship is that when, yeah. when we met, I think you looked at me as somebody who maybe had some potential to grow as a leader. And I looked at you as somebody like, Hey, I think I could learn something from, uh, that lady as well. And so I think um, finding mentors is huge on the journey because a book can teach you something and, and a lot of things, but somebody who's actually said, hey, I did it. Let me show you what I did. That's invaluable. So I would say finding mentors is huge. And then I would say getting started. I think a lot of people spend a lot of time thinking and planning and all of that type of stuff, but you got to start somewhere. And once you start to get started, you can get a taste and a feel of, I think you need to feel both things as quick as possible, success and failure. I think success gives you a sense of, I get a glimpse of what my life could be, but failure gives you a taste of, oh, wow, I want to learn so I don't do that again. And so I would say having a mentor, getting started um, are some of the biggest things that would be really 
helpful along the journey. And then something I'm not naturally good at, but I feel like after 25 years I've had to develop is patience. You are not uh -huh. going to get to be a huge success if you're not patient. And so having patience is a really important uh, part of growth. Like John Maxwell says, part of being a leader is waiting for other people to catch up, right? We're just always waiting sometimes as a leader. Now you cast vision very, very well. What are some ways and how often do you cast vision? Yeah, so when it comes to vision, I try to cast vision every day in every way I can possibly, I possibly can. So in every meeting, I'm trying to think about how can I draw people back to the bigger vision that I'm trying to set? For me, I'm obviously on stage uh, on Sundays, every Sunday. Every Sunday, I'm trying to put the vision in front of people. Because here's what I know about vision. I know you know this about vision too, is that what I feel passionate about, it takes a while for people to understand. They have questions about it. They have concerns about it. And the idea about vision is I see it. And oftentimes vision is many times seeing something that doesn't exist yet. Not everybody else sees what I see. So I've got to do, and I've got to paint as many pictures as I can to help them see it. So, so repetition is huge. So I literally try to cast vision um, with my organization in every meeting I can in simple ways and, um, and and in big ways as much as I possibly can. Um, and one of the great things that I'm excited about is if you talk to anybody in my organization, whether it's my board, my staff, my executive team, they could tell you the vision because I say it so much. And I say it with passion and energy because I believe it. So, yeah. I think that's great because so many companies, they have it printed up on their wall and yet nobody even knows what it is. They pass by it every day and they couldn't tell you the mission and vision of the company, yet every single one of your people can. Mm -hmm. And I think about you as a pastor every Sunday delivering a message that is different, that is compelling, that connects with the people and teaches them how to have a better life. Mm -hmm. How much time does it take you to prepare for a Sunday sermon? Yeah, so I'll answer that in two different ways. So I um, tried to be about three months ahead in my big ideas and then kind of the big, plan that I'm going after. And then every day as I'm coming up to that Sunday, I'm asking myself, how can I make this more practical? How can I make this more fresh? So I would say probably 10 to 30 hours, but it's not like all I'm sitting at the computer the whole time. I'm just constantly thinking, dreaming, and figuring out how can I say something in a fresh way, almost even to the moment that I come in on stage and I'm looking at the audience, I'm trying to keep that in a very fresh way so that by the time what people hear is something that's both took a lot of thought and preparation, but it's also very alive and fresh in me. So I would say, um, it takes a lot of time, but it's not always the time of just sitting in front of a computer or even practicing in front of a mirror. It's constantly thinking about it to the point where I feel that passion. And most times I can share most of what I'm saying without notes because I've spent so much time thinking about the big idea and the concept. So, well, see, the thing I love about that is a lot of business people. They, they go into a meeting. Some of them don't even know what they're going to talk about until 10 minutes before the meeting. Everything you're doing is such great leadership techniques, and you're teaching mm. us skills of leaders. Uh, Steve Jobs said, hey, for every hour I'm on stage, I'm going to spend probably 30 hours preparing. Well, you just said the same thing. Mm -hmm. You're on up in front of people at church. 
and yet you've taken all this time, way ahead of time, to prepare. So I'm going to challenge all of our business people that are listening to this. Take advice from Keith. Start preparing way ahead and put that vision into every meeting that you hold. Because I received somebody the other day, they called me and they said, oh, we just had a meeting. I wish they'd have put in an email, right? Mm. <laughs> they didn't have to have that meeting. You go in prepared. How important is preparation in all levels of leadership? Yeah, I think preparation is the game because I think when it comes down to it, we can always tell when somebody's not prepared. And I think there's levels of preparation too. I can tell if you're not prepared emotionally because you're 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 just not there. I can tell if you're not prepared organizationally. So I think when it comes to preparation it is the key to success and you know you've probably heard this everybody says this that there's no such thing as overnight success. And I think that's what preparation does is it's getting you ready for that moment. So for me when it comes to preparing a message or preparing for a meeting, I'm spending time thinking through all the things. Okay, how do I want to set it up? Even like I said, conflict. I think what makes conflict easier is preparing for it. It's preparing for what you're going to say, preparing for emotionally. What is that person going to feel? Giving them time to respond. So, and, and like for me on Sundays, I spent my week preparing mentally on Sundays. I'm preparing myself emotionally and, and just ready to be on stage and be and connect. And I think that that's the part that really helps. And even when I go into board meetings, I'm trying to be prepared to communicate what I'm communicating with passion so that they understand whatever it is that we're trying to accomplish. There's not just thought but there's also the emotional preparation. And I think that that's the part that sometimes can also be missing is not just the physical, practical, but also that, that, that engagement, you know what I mean? Do you have thinking time in your schedule? And if so, how often is that thinking time? Yeah, I would say that um, I try to do it at least twice a day. So I try to do it at the beginning of my day. And then I try to do it reflecting at the end of my day. Okay, so reflection at the end of the day. What are some questions you ask yourself during that reflection time? Well, one of the things I'm trying to ask myself is what was my greatest win of the day? Where did I win the most? The second question I'm asking myself is... Um, where was I at my best? And sometimes in what I do, some most times I don't get caught off guard because I've got, you know, an assistant and I've got an executive team that helps me manage. But in the times where I'm caught off guard, I want to go, hey, was I at my best there or could I have been better at my best? Could I have figured out a way to be at my best? Um, and then the last thing I'm always asking myself is how could I have done that better? You know, um, but yeah, that's what I would say. Well, you're very intentional in everything that you do. It sounds like intentionality is a big thing with you. Is that correct? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. You also love to be challenged. Mm -hmm. So what are the challenges that you're putting in front of you right now? Yeah. Wow. That's a great question. Um, I would say the stuff that I'm doing with the Maxwell team is is fun to me, is stepping out, helping other leaders um, is something that is a great passion of mine. And, and it's a challenge because I have a busy life. You know, it's not like I just yeah. just sitting around. So I would say that that's a big thing. Um, I'm a part of the executive team for a uh, network. So helping that network is a big deal. That's a challenge of mine. Um, and then I'm always just trying to challenge myself by growing and learning. So I try to read um, four to eight books a month. And that's, that is a challenge uh, because if you're busy, 
it's really easy to just get caught up doing. So I'm always trying to challenge myself with new thoughts and new ideas. Um, so yeah, those are some of the ways that I'm trying to challenge what, myself. What are some of the books that you think everybody that's listening to us should read? All right. Well, I would say High Road Leadership by John Maxwell is just... Oh, yeah. It's a great one. It, it, it's the book for right now. Um, and it doesn't matter if you're in politics. It doesn't matter if you're... Uh, in the faith world, in the nonprofit world, if you're in the for-profit world, um, High Road Leadership, 360 Leadership is a great book by Maxwell as well, 360 Degree Leader, because he talks about wherever you're at in the organization, how to have influence and be real practical. But one of the ones that I would say it's a business book that's really impacted a lot of my thinking is execution, the discipline of getting things done by Larry Bossidy and, and Ram, Ram Sharon, Sharan. It is just so good because that very idea that I, I talked about, about how to have a hard conversation, follow up with the email, that's something that Larry Bossidy uh, talks about in, um, in that book. And then I also think Crucial Conversations is a great book. If you're going to be in leadership, you're going to have to have tense conversations that have dynamics to them and learning how to have those conversations are huge. So those are some of my favorites. When you read so many books, how do you implement the things? Because here you are, you're reading, mm -hmm. you're taking notes. How do you choose what you're going to implement out of that book? So a few things. Number one, is for me, I try to train. So if if I read something good, I try to train my staff on it. And in training my staff on it, it allows it to go deeper in my mind and allows me to get those big ideas. Number two is I try to um, ask myself, where can I apply this in the next two weeks to the next month? Um, That's good. And, and then I, I try to also share that with other people. So training, applying, and then the more I'm sharing and talking about it with other people, it basically sharpens my idea. Because if you say, hey, tell me what's the big idea out of Larry Bossidy's book, or what's the big idea about John Maxwell's book? Well, that forces me to take all of what I just learned and distill it in a way that that is basically a summary. So those are kind of some of the ways that I would. By teaching your staff, you're actually going deeper yourself and regurgitating that information. Do you have them go on to teach others as well? Or does it pretty much just stop with you teaching? Yeah. And, and, and then the more you can have exercise, and I read a lot of business leadership books, like um, we were just with uh, John Gordon, and, and he just wrote a book about uh, having hard conversations. Um, one of the great things about like a book like that is there are practical things you can do. So the accountability as a team to say, hey, how did we do that is also a great way to, um, as we're growing in skills together, then it's also sinking in in a deeper sense because he lays out basically a formula to have a hard conversation and then also some ways to to like develop a plan. So I think if you're growing in a skill with your team, everybody's learning it in a way that um, we're all we're all a little awkward together, but we're getting better together. And I think that's also how you keep a team challenged and engaged. Well, and you said earlier, you didn't use these words. What I picked up is it's not what you earn here. It's what you learn here. And you have that great learning environment. How did you create that learning environment within your people to where they desire to learn? Yeah, I think for me, number one is I'm trying to lead by example. That's the biggest part of it is trying to if you tell people to be leaders, readers, generous, and you're not doing it, then you've lost credibility. So I try to lead by example first. Number two is I try to um, 
like I said, share with people, hey, here's what I'm learning. Here's how how I'm learning it. Um, so bring them along on a journey. And then I'm just asking the question, what are you reading? What's What are you learning? So I think asking the question is a big thing because the questions you ask as a leader, people will start to, really smart, intuitive people will start to find out what's important to you. If well, all you ask great. about is one thing, yeah. Yeah, you're great at asking questions because when we were around the table, I noticed that you were asking questions of a lot of people there, learning from them, getting to know them. You seem to build relationships very quickly. What advice do you have for all of our listeners about building relationships and going deep with those relationships? Yeah, and I would say I'm very intentional about that because I think who you surround yourself with really determines who you become. You know, we're talking about becoming more. So I would say when it comes to relationships, part of asking questions helps you understand what matters to somebody too, like for you as a leader. So I feel like as I'm listening to people, I'm trying to figure out, are they the kind of people that we have compatibility that I'm compatible with. And I like people who are a little different from me, who think a little bit differently, maybe even believe a little bit differently. So if we're compatible and we can have conversation and we can learn from each other, I think that's really a key for me understanding how I can, how far I can go in a relationship. Um, so that's what I would say is just looking for compatibility asking questions, and then also understanding that I can't be deep with everybody, but I can be deep with some people. And if we are compatible and we have the right kind of expectations, then we're we're on the same page. Like, you know what I mean? But if like, if somebody wants to hang out with me every day, I'm not that kind of guy. But if somebody is more, they, they are hungry, they're passionate, they, they, they have, you know, a certain amount of time, we, we're probably a good fit, if that makes sense. Or if they're a fan of your greatest sports team, right? Then you kind of connect. <laughs> yeah. that, that was a joke. I, <laughs> so leadership, it's, I say it's deceptively simple and endlessly mm. complicated, kind of like mm. what they say about golf. With our listeners right now, what is leadership advice that you have for them that I haven't asked you about that you want to share? Yeah, I would say a few things. Number one, I think when it when it comes to leadership, if you're going to be a point leader, you have to be good at um, managing and leading finances, which is something that I think Oh, Sometimes good. people put a lot of focus on uh, vision, big ideas, and they think somebody else will come and fill in all those other gaps. And I think people can, but if you're going to be the point leader of an organization, you have to be uh, at least skilled at managing and leading finances really well. The second thing is having emotional capacity. You have to be a person who lives a life of, of some version of self-control because leadership is just going to hit you. You're going to have great days and bad days. And sometimes you don't even realize this is about to be your best day or your worst day. And you have to have ways to manage yourself. If you're looking to the people you lead to make you feel good about yourself, if you're looking to all these other things, you're going to find yourself unstable, but, but, but having great emotional capacity. And then I, I like to come back to um, fire and passion, vision, fire and passion is you've got to find ways to keep that stirred up on the inside of you. And people can help you with that, but you've got to be the person who takes responsibility for that. And if you can do those things, then there's a lot of other pieces that will come into place for you. But if you can keep yourself stable, if you can have fire and vision and passion, and if you can raise finances and lead finances, then staffing, 
breakthroughs, all that other stuff seems to, in my mind, um, you got to get good at it and you got to learn those stuff, but they tend to come around you. And, and I've got to tell you, The Psychology of Money is a great book that I know mm -hmm. if you haven't read it, boy, read it. it. I know you've already read it. And when it comes to finances, that's so important. So finances, vision, fire in the belly, let that passion show. I really appreciate you being with us today. So let's have some parting words on how you would give hope to everybody listening to this about becoming a great leader and becoming more. Yeah, I would say, number one, thanks for listening. The other thing I would say is um, start. I would say wherever you're at today, you got to get started and, and just one step at a time. You don't get to becoming more by taking shortcuts. Take one step at a time. What can you do today to become more? Well, and I know you're becoming more. You've got businesses. You run a church. You do so many things and you've helped many other people become more because I got to talk with some of your staff before we did the podcast. So everyone listening or watching this on YouTube, know that we care about you. We desire for you to become more. Come back next Tuesday and hear our next time where once again, you'll be hearing someone else's story. In your life, you deserve to be more be more, do more, have more, and give more. And now the Becoming More podcast with Diana Kokoska. I